Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, lecture. Uh, we are continuing the last lecture that we talked about uh, biopotentials, uh, we talked about uh, ECG, we talked about EMG, uh, we talked about EOG uh, and uh, uh, we also talked about EEG, right. So, uh, we will continue the uh, EEG uh, part of it and I told you that the if you understand how to analyze the signal, how to read those signals, uh, then you can apply for several uh, important healthcare problems. Now, when I say apply that means that you can have solutions for some of the gaps. For example, uh, uh, epilepsy, right, uh, how to uh, prepare an algorithm to quickly uh, uh, you know diagnose the timestamp at which the epileptic episodes are there. So, we will be discussing on that, um, I am just uh, giving an example uh, that will aid the uh, neurophysiologist to un understand that uh, uh, where exactly at which time point, uh, stamp uh, he or she needs to uh, go and read the signals. Now, um, that you can only do when you understand how the brain signal works, is not it. And before we understand how brain signal works, uh, we understand that how the EEG looks like because EEG is a brain signal. And um, uh, but but when we say is a brain signal, there are other brain waves. Uh, so uh, again, brain waves falls in a different category. We, we call some waves as beta, some as alpha, some as theta, some as delta waves. So let us understand uh, what does each of these represents. Okay. Uh, so uh, brain waves, uh, uh, as you can see from the slide, are commonly measured as peak to peak voltage. And normally, normally the range uh, of these brain waves uh, is from 0.5 micro volts all the way to 100 micro volts. And uh, uh, as you can see that these are micro volts and these are 100 times lower than the EC signals. EC signals actually are in milli volts, is not it? So, sometimes it is like uh, really uh, uh, very, very small signal. And if it is really small signal, that means that for those who understand the electronics, the uh, it is very important to design the uh, module such that the signal to noise ratio is really high, right. Uh, so, that we do not uh, capture the noise and we do not uh, you know uh, uh, miscalculate the uh, signals, uh, 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 noise is the signals. So, uh, what we can do is that uh, uh, using the Fourier transform uh, power spectrum, the raw EEG signals are derived and the brain state of individual may uh, make certain frequencies more dominant. Uh, brain waves uh, have been categorized into four basic groups. Uh, on the right side, those groups are given the uh, one uh, which is uh, uh, beta that we call beta which is here are the waves which are greater than 13 hertz and uh, uh, they are obtained when a person is awake uh, but non-focused, relaxed, drowsy or non-vigilant. Uh, that means that the low level of environmental stimulations. But we call we go one step further which is your alpha right. Uh, in that case uh, you need to uh, you need to see that this frequency will be between 8 to 13 hertz and this is for people who are awake, alert, focused attention and problem solving. Uh, REM sleep uh, or dreaming sleep, high level of environmental simulation example eyes are open. So, if you are really awake and listening to my lecture, right, you are focused and if I um, measure the signals from your brain, it should fall somewhere in alpha region. Uh, theta is 4 to 8 hertz and it is visual imaginary uh, is like really light sleep right uh, and hypnobomic uh, imagery. Uh, so, uh, when you when you start sleeping right light sleep right generally uh, the signals are there. Uh, well, delta uh, shows uh, 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 restful sleep, deep sleep, vague dream states right. So, generally when a person is in a deep restful sleep, the delta signal will be there uh, between 0.5 and 4 hertz. So, uh, these are the uh, theta signals these are the delta signals, these are the beta signals. Now, what are these signals? 
if you read uh, it is difficult for you to read, but it is epilepsy and epilepsy has a several characteristics. We will go into epilepsy in one of the class uh, to understand how epilepsy not really go into epilepsy. We will go to understand the epilepsy in one of the, one of the class to uh, see the how signals are uh, uh, arising in case of epileptic ep patients suffering from epilepsy. Uh, particularly there are slow waves, there are spikes, there are combination of slow waves and spikes and so on. Uh, so, let us go to the next slide uh, EEG potentials. So, EEG potentials are good indicators of global brain state. They often display rhythmic patterns at characteristic frequencies. In the left side if you see uh, there is a excited uh, state, a relaxed state, a drowsy state, a sleep, deep sleep and coma. And you can clearly see uh, that when the person is relaxed versus person is in deep sleep uh, versus person who is asleep and drowsy and if a person is excited how the signals are varying. Now, we have seen alpha, beta, alpha, theta, delta, but what about gamma? Hmm? So, gamma is generally between 31 and 100 hertz and its peak focus expanded consciousness. Okay. So, in that case you will be able to see the gamma signals. As we have discussed in the previous slides, beta is in 16 to 30 hertz and it shows alertness, concentration, cognition, alpha between 8 and 15 hertz relaxation, visualization, creativity, theta between 4 and 7 hertz, meditation, intuition, memory, while delta 0 0.1 to 3 hertz detached awareness, detached awareness, healing or sleeping, deep sleep mode. <coughs> Uh, as I told you that generally the system uh, that is used for recording this brain waves right is uh, uh, we use about uh, we, we use different part of the brain or the skull right. Uh, the towards your nose is called nasion and towards the uh, back of the uh, head is called inion. Uh, we have uh, frontal area, we have central area, we have peri parietal area, we have temporal area and we have occipital area. So, prefrontal area, frontal area, uh, central area, temporal area, parietal area and the occipital area. So, this is the different regions which we call F and then C for central, T for temporal, P for parietal, O for occipital, F for frontal and then the system, uh, the electrodes are placed in this particular uh, uh, in this particular regions and we call that as a 1020 system. Uh, around 21 electrodes are used uh, in various ways or montages and we use a wet electrode to reduce the impedance. However, recently you have seen that lot of uh, caps are coming, a uh, lot of variables are coming with EEG band. Uh, and that can be used with dry electrodes. So, they, they use dry electrodes. Uh, there are certain advantages of dry electrodes over wet electrodes, but anyways. So, so the basic advantage is like you do not have to worry about putting a gel and reducing the impedance right. The, the dry electrode will directly uh, you can you can you can connect to a variable and the you can get the signals as good as wet electrodes. You also do not require an expert if you go for dry electrodes versus wet electrodes. So, like I said uh, the even number of these electrodes are right side of the head, the odd numbers are left side of the head. Internationally everyone uses twin density system which ensures the consistency uh, F as I told you is frontal, T temporal, C central etcetera. This is how the EEG uh, recording looks like when it is in continuous fashion. 
So, what are the pros of measuring this EEG and what are the cons of measuring EEG? The advantages is that uh, the EEG has good time resolution like in milliseconds compared to seconds with fMRI. It is portable and affordable, it is more tolerant to subject moment than fMRI. EEG is silent and so useful for studying auditory processing. Since EEG has no noise, it is easier for you, us to use for auditory processing. Finally, EEG can be combined with fMRI or transmagnetic stimulation called TMS. The limitations or cons of EEG are low spatial resolution, artifacts or noise. So, uh, I will show you some of the video then uh, we continue after that. Hi, so in this demonstration we will show you how biopotential is recorded as professor already mentioned we required uh, 3 electrodes active uh, reference and ground electrode. Here we will show one of the uh, in house develop system uh, in our lab for ongoing research. So, you can see this particular headband ok. So, this kind this headband uh, has several electrodes as you can see here there is one electrode here, one electrode is here and one electrode is here. So, there are multiple electrodes additionally this left side ear clip kind of electrode and this electrode work as a reference and ground. So, using this thing, this thing can be wear by any subject very quickly this is a fastener which is used uh, to adjust for different head size. Additionally, you can use several materials which is of made of flexible resin which will help you to incorporate different head size because not everyone's size is same right. So, this headband would be wore with different electrodes at a proper position you should also know where to put electrode. Once that is done you can acquire the biopotential using uh, known ADCs. So, this is one such box which has that ADC inside. So, uh, this electrode whatever you can see from here this thing is connected with this box which ultimately takes those biopotentials and further it will wirelessly transmit to a particular uh, system or your laptop. So, now we will see how one subject is being prepared when he wear this particular headband and we can take the data how it looks like and all this thing now. So, as you can see uh, one of my friend is already wearing the headband which I have shown currently for the sake of simplicity uh, we will show it in one channel where electrode is placed here ok. Wires have been shielded because it is very important in order to mitigate power line interferences which is one of the major bottleneck when it comes to biopotential recording. It also depends on which potential you are recording uh, for ECG as a professor mentioned it comes within the millivolt range for EEG it comes in microvolt range which is more uh, susceptible to this kind of uh, noises. So, uh, uh, my friend is wearing this thing also you can see this both sides there are ear clip electrodes uh, here as uh, here and here both sides ok. So, uh, once it the biopotential is recorded how it looks like or how it is being recorded. Currently, we are using one open access uh, open BCI uh, Cyton board which comes with its own software design suit. So, I will show you in that GUI how it looks like. So, if you can see my screen ok here there are 4 widgets right. Uh, first one is stands for your time uh, domain waveform. Uh, which is this one. Second one is that frequency spectrum, amplitude spectrum very important to notice that which particular frequency whether it is in neural uh, range or non neural range. Uh, the third one is uh, you know this is a digital pin. So, when you do event related potential now in one of the module I have covered event related potential what are the applications of that and all this thing. So, here if you are giving some form of stimuli be it auditory, visual or touch ok uh, timing information would be provided in this digital triggers. So, this is also an important provision to have when you want to go from free running EEG to ERPs right. Also one another important thing is this band power. 
So, band power is nothing but uh, when your particular uh, uh, range of frequency uh, is more prominent, uh, then you can see uh, whether there is a prominence in alpha, delta, beta, gamma, theta. Here we have only recorded from second channel, so I disabled all the other channels, right. So, let us quickly uh, see that. So, now I would uh, like to ask uh, my friend to do a certain task, so which we can see the reflection in terms of EEG or biopotential. One more thing is here we are recording from the forehead, so from the uh, mid of the forehead area. So then it is uh, you know we will get some response with respect to some of the manoeuvres, we are recording it from here. Okay, currently, the it is called FPZ as per 1020 system. Now, what is 1020 system? I have already uh, informed you. So, when I will ask him to do certain known maneuvers, it will uh, reflect in terms of that particular EEG pattern or that particular I would say biopotential pattern because some of them are not really from brain, but it is again a biopotential to check whether the acquisition board or you know your electronics uh, subsystem works fine or not. So, if uh, now let us see if you can see my screen now, I will uh, start uh, free running EEG with all this uh, known settings. So, you can see this is the initial burst of wireless communication ignore that, but I will ask the subject to blink twice. Can you blink now? Yeah, so you can see two times a similar uh, footprint of that particular thing. Okay, I will again ask him to blink couple of times just for a verification. You can see him also the screen also. Yeah, similar reflection can be observed here, right? Also, when I ask him to clench his jaw, so first you see when he is clenching there, we will see the reflection later. Hari, can you please cl uh, clench your jaws? So, you can see high frequency high amplitude noise which is due to the clenching of the jaw. We will repeat that one more time. Yeah, you can see the screen again the similar high frequency burst is observed, right. Also you can see delta, theta, alpha, beta at which particular time along with the range of frequency which band dominates, okay. When you are about to sleep or feeling drowsy low frequency band will be higher. So, the same thing can be used for sleep staging or you know sleep uh, quality measurement etc. Also the same thing can be used to check the drowsiness, also some more widgets are there to identify how much focus you are, how much relaxed you are. So, if you have this electrode placement proper, right, if you have this entire experimental protocol proper, you can uh, you know explore by your own and leverage several uh, applications. Uh, which I have already mentioned in some of the on other videos as well. So, this was a brief demonstration of how biopotential are recorded, how it can be monitored, how it can be interpreted. So, uh, I will see you in some other class, but this was a just a short demo to make you people understand how EEG or how biopotentials is recorded. Thank you. So, now what are the potential applications of these EEG signals? isn't it. So, like we have seen the potential applications of ECG and EMG, the potential applications of EEG are many. It monitors alertness, coma and brain death. It can be used to locate areas of damage following head injury, stroke, tumor, etcetera. It can be used to test different uh, afferent pathways like by evoke potentials that is called auditory evoke potentials or auditory brain response which is called ABR or AEP. It can be used to monitor the cognitive engagement for example, alpha rhythm, produce biofeedback situations, control anesthesia depth, we also call servo anesthesia investigate epilepsy and locate seizure location or origin, test epilepsy drug effects, assist in experimental cortical excision of epileptic focus, monitor human and animal brain development, test drugs for convulsive effects or convulsive effects. 
investigate sleep disorder and physiology, but the applications are way beyond what are written on the slides. We can use EEG uh, signals, understanding of EEG signals for Parkinson, for dementia, right. We can use to study the health of the brain, okay. Just not development of the brain, but the health of the brain. And um, hearing screening is one of the very important uh, problem uh, in young adults as well as in newborns which are called neonates. So, EEG is a method to understand whether a neonate can uh, hear or not. So, like I said the potential applications of EEG are many. Now, uh, if you want to do a laboratory testing of electrophysiology right again um, do not uh, get too much worried about the uh, the electronics that goes behind it. It is very simple block diagrams in a in a way for for people who are not from electronics background. The people who are from the electronics background it is they will understand it very easily right. I will try to make it as easy as simple as possible. So, EEG measurement system consists of the following. The first one is electrodes that is either dry or wet, wet requires a conductive media uh, gel to improve the impedance. We require amplifiers and filters, so to amplify the signal because your signals are of very low amplitude and uh, the, uh, to remove the artifacts we require the uh, filters. And finally, you require a DSO digital oscilloscope for analyzing the signal in the laboratory environment. Then you require recording electrodes. These recording electrodes are used for acquiring recording the high quality EEG signals. And several different electrodes are used for testing. The first one is disposable which does not require gel or which already has pre-gel types. We can use a disc electrode which are reusable which is made up of or coated by gold, silver, stainless steel, tin, headbands, electro caps, saline based electrodes and inner electrodes. But the most commonly used are the AG, AGCL disc of 1 to 3 millimeter diameter, whereas the needle electrodes are used for length recordings and are invasive in nature, right. Invasive that means we can place the needle inside the brain. So, as I told you, we require amplifiers and filters and signal conditioning circuits are required in order to amplify and make compatible with the recording devices such as displays, readers, analog to digital converters. However, acquired signal will be of very low magnitude and contains artifact. Thus, we should have an amplifier and a filter because to improve the signal to voice ratio right. Higher the signal to noise ratio better the uh, signal quality. The basic requirements that a biopsy amplifier should satisfy are the following. The amplifier should not distort the measure signal. The physiological process to be monitored should not be influenced in any way by the amplifiers, so, amplifiers should not influence any any negative way or even it should not interfere at all. The amplifier should provide the best possible separation of signals and interferences. The amplifier has to offer protection of the patient from any hazard of electrical shock. The amplifier itself has to be protected against damages that might result from a high input voltages as they occur during the application of defibrillators or electrosurgical instruments. So, these are the some of the parameters that the amplifier should uh, follow. So, keeping all this thing in mind, we can say that the amplifier 
that is the circuit that is used to amplify the signal right. should have the following features and I have written here has the following features because I will be showing the circuit uh, in, a, in a few moments. First is the differential amplification with driven shield inputs which makes it workable even in electrically unshielded environments that increases the SNR. High input impedance low bias current to allow recordings of small signals, dual fixed frequency bandpass and independent gain controllers to allow the recording of different signals from the same source moderate CMRR right or common mode rejection ratio uh, which is the ratio of the differential gain to the common mode gain. Now the artifacts and filtering right, so what can be different what are the different artifacts and we all know that the signal distortions due to artifacts contaminants contaminates the original each signal and results in change in the sequence either with higher amplitude or by changing the signal shape. The cause of artifacts in recording each signals is either due to the patient related or technical. So, what are the patient related artifacts? First one is body moments, then EMG, then ECG, then eye moments, then sitting right. So, all this different uh, things can result in the patient related artifacts. If the patient moves while the signals are acquiring, uh, the EMG signals will arise because from the muscles, ECG if you have pacemaker uh, and then there are eye moments and the way you sit, the way you are uh, required to follow the procedure all these things may related to the patient related artifacts. While the technical artifacts are from 50 to 60 hertz power line interference, impedance fluctuation, cable moment and broken wire contacts. But if you want to reduce the AC line interference noise then you can reduce the, the electrode wires and you can decrease the electrode impedance uh, or the if the electrode impedance is decreased then the line frequency noise or AC power line noise can be decreased. So, these are the some of the points that we need to uh, take care of. So, based on that what kind of filter we will we require right or we are going to design. So, it should be a high pass filter which is required for reducing low frequency coming from the bioelectric flowing potentials example breathing etcetera. Its cutoff frequency usually lies in the range of 0 0.1 to 0 0.7 hertz. To ensure that signal is band limited a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency equal to highest frequency of our interest is used in the range up to 40 hertz to less than one half of the sampling rate right. So, if you see now the entire circuit that is used to acquire the signal amplify the signal and show the output right then we have uh, initial input stage right which the signal will come from the electrodes to the input stage. Then there is a broadband amplifier, so it will amplify the signals, we can control the gain you can see here by the gain controller and finally, you have a band pass filter at the output you can either have low frequency band or you can have a high frequency band. So, these are four different stages you can say or blocks uh, when you are looking at the electrophysiological signals that are EEG signals that arises from the electrodes and has to be processed uh, through the electronic module. Now, those who are interested in understanding a bit more uh, the first stage circuit which we are talking about 
the input stage amplifier we say 1, this is the second stage, this is the third one and you have here fourth one. The first one uses INA 116 right, where is it written INA 116 here ok. Because it is critical stage and the overall performance of amplifier decided by this stage. The feature of this IC is shield inputs, you can see that inputs are shielded. The influence of the shield that is the capacitance between the electrode and the shield which is considered as a noise can be cancelled with the connection of the input coaxial cable through the buffered guard drive pins thus preventing the electrostatic interference through the capacitive coupling between them. Additionally, it is expected or uh, it is exceptionally high input impedance, it has uh, so that is that is a beauty of the amplifier that it has a very high impedance and low input bias current making it a suitable choice to record signals of slow amplitude so or small amplitudes, low amplitudes uh, through high signal source impedance. The difficulty with this is the slew rate is only 0.8 volts per microsecond. Therefore, if the gain is too high, its output may be distorted for fast changing input. Therefore, the gain stage or the gain of the next stage uh, or this process is limited to 19.5. If, uh, if, the, if the signals are not too fast, right, if the gain, if the gain is not too high then it is fine, but if the gain is extremely high then because of the slew rate the signal may be distorted. The next stage is a band pass filtering stage 2, it uses 2 pole filter with a gain of 93.4, hence it can filter the noise signal with amplification also its output recovers faster when the amplifier is agitated by sudden changes in DC offset of the input. The upper and lower cutoff frequency can be independently changed without affecting the gain by replacing the capacitors. The next stage is a gain controller stage, in this stage a capacitor is used to cut off the DC offset from the previous stage, hence the switch is connected across the fixed resistor. So, what does it mean? You can see here right, you can you have a switch here, you have a switch here, so that is the use of that and uh, the fixed resistor that you, you were able to see in the circuit right is for the further attenuation of the next stage if required. The final stage if you see it has a band pass filter with amplification it allows to separate the input signals to two different frequencies as a low frequency signal and high frequency signals uh, with an amplification. You can see uh, there is a band pass filter for low frequency band and a high frequency band you can have the the input separated into two different frequency ranges. So, what we have seen right, we have seen how the EEG signals can be acquired, we have seen how 1020 system can be used, uh, how the electrodes can be placed, by placing electrode how we acquire the signals. If you can acquire the signals then just acquiring signal is not a big deal, but to process the signal is and that is why to process the signal what we have, we have uh, input stage, then we have a filter stage, then we have a gain amplifier, then we have a band pass filter, we can get a low frequency and a high frequency at the output. Now, let us stop here and uh, let us go for the further applications of this EEG signals that we have acquired in the next class. Uh, till then you just look into this uh, entire lecture and uh, we will continue uh, one step further, now we are talking about the external side right, so electrodes are placed on the skull, on the scalp. What about I want to acquire signal from the brain itself, that means that I want to open the skull, remove the dura and we can see the brain floating in CSF, can you implant the device onto the brain and acquire signal right. So, in that case what we need to do, we will see also we will quickly uh, run through a few slides which shows uh, the importance of understanding the EEG signals. Alright, so I will see you next class till then you take care, bye.